That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Bad Things, the second film directed by Stuart Thorndike, uh, which just premiered at the 2023 Tribeca Film Festival. It is being released on August 18th, 2023, courtesy of AMC Plus and Shudder. Do you know Stuart's first film? Uh, her first film was Lyle, which... <laughs> To me, that's more of a medium-length film, uh, but it starred Gabby Hoffman. It's a little over an hour, and it's kind of a lesbian take on Rosemary's Baby, and I did quite like that. Bad Things. The story. A group of friends go to a hotel for a weekend getaway and soon discover that women do bad things there. <laughs> so that premise is really intriguing, and I watched the trailer and I was intrigued. Mm -hmm. My pull quote, <laughs> bad things is a good example of a filmmaker biting off more than they can chew. Mm -hmm. uh, mine is cancel your reservations. Bad things can't decide on its own psychosis as it wastes an eerie locale on a handful of underdeveloped characters. I didn't care for this one. I didn't either. There were certain elements I liked, but I think that tonally it's all over the place. I don't think the script is that great, uh, although some of the cast members are able to navigate that better than others. The basic story is interesting, mm -hmm. but I agree. The script is not where it needs to be. So a group of four ladies, the lead is a woman named Ruthie. Mm -hmm. Played by Gail Rankin. And Ruthie, her grandmother died and Ruthie inherited a hotel which we know is abandoned. So when we meet this group of friends, they have shown up to this hotel, just the four of them, to spend like a final weekend because Ruthie is planning on selling the hotel. That, which is called Comely Suites. So the friends, one of them, Kel, played by... Hari Neff. She's the girlfriend of Ruthie, so it's four lesbians. Then... Another woman named Maddie. Mm -hmm. Played by Rad Pereira. And Fran. Annabelle Dexter Jones. So immediately Fran, when, the, when we first meet Fran, she seems like a problem. And then she starts to see things. Because we, there's so much happening. We find out that Ruthie has I issues with infidelity as it pertains to her girlfriend, Kel. The, Fran sort of pushes up on Ruthie and they have like a sexual encounter and cal and maddie used to be an item and maddie still seems hung up on her so they have all that drama going on fran starts becoming delusional she's seeing weird things include so then we get like the shining vibes very much so mm -hmm. because she at one point fran sees a bunch of people eating in this abandoned restaurant who are not really there. Which is like that scene with the people in the animal masks in The Shining. But she ends up freaking out and saying, like, we all have to leave. Mm -hmm. And the other three ladies don't know what to do. So they're like, okay, let's all leave. They all go to the train station, but they leave Fran there and then come back to the hotel to finish off the weekend. So it's important to know Ruthie's mother, mm -hmm. the one who's pressuring her to sell the hotel... They seem to be close, like, there's a lot of, like, text messaging and talking about the mom. Actually, they're estranged, and they've only just uh, become reacquainted. The mom was in a relationship with a much younger man. Who, Brian. Brian, who worked at the hotel when it was operational. Brian shows up immediately because, and this is important, he's like, well, isn't your mom here? Like, her car's parked outside. And Ruthie's like, no, she's not here. Okay, another important fact is Ruthie is like we see her like four different on four different occasions watching a YouTube video on her phone of Molly Ringwald mm -hmm. giving a TED talk about hospitality mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so everything culminates with Fran was dropped off at the train station but Ruthie thinks she sees her like return and as the audience we see her as well but then someone who's dressed kind of like Ruthie who's wearing a CPAP machine, and we know Ruthie wears a CPAP to bed, is like wielding a chainsaw and attacks and kills Brian. Who suddenly pops back up. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there's that going on, but Maddie also gets attacked by the same figure, like her arm gets cut pretty badly. So now Maddie and Kel are freaking out. Fran has inadvertently, I wouldn't say she's been killed, but she dies. 
Because she gets like scared and falls into like an empty pool. If she indeed was there. If she was actually there. Fran also sent a video of her rendezvous with Ruthie to the other two women. So the other two women are mad at Ruthie because she cheated on Kale. It's so much happening. They are scared because they think she's the one who had the chainsaw and hurt Maddie. But where everything gets real crazy is, first off, Ruthie walks into a conference room because she sees Molly Ringwald in there. Mm -hmm. And Molly's like, oh yeah, I'm a consultant for the real estate firm and the lawyers are here for you to sign the papers to sell the hotel. Ruthie says she doesn't want to sell. They get mad and leave. And then the other two ladies discover after that... I think just Maddie discovers... The body of Molly Ringwald in one of the hotel rooms. And we had been told in the beginning by Ruthie, don't go to the third floor because there was flooding. So just don't even bother going up there. Blood flooding. Mm -hmm. But we see that the reason she said that is because Molly Ringwald's body is up there and it looks like she's been dead for a while. And much like room 237 in The Shining, this thing that's hidden in a room, the secret. And then we find out that Molly Ringwald is Ruthie's mom. Mm -hmm. So Ruthie kills her mother. There are other little clues, like later on we see that Ruthie has her mom's cell phone. Mm -hmm. So all that texting that was happening back and forth, it looks like Ruthie was doing it to herself. And then, of course, Ruthie uh, attacks Maddie and Kel, and she kills them with a chainsaw in the parking lot of a pretty busy commercial plaza. Mm -hmm. And they just, they're just falling on a mound of snow and can't get up. The end. Man, I... Uh... There are some interesting things about it. Like, it's kind of like The Shining at Motel 6. But... Uh, with, I, mixed with high tension. With, mixed with <laughs> high tension. Uh, it, it, except their lesbianism being what has caused her to be crazy, per se. It is her um, attachment issues with her mother. Because we're told all kinds of things about her childhood. Like, basically reared by her grandma. Because her mom has disappeared. Um, and there the, are allusions to her having been like maybe abused <clears throat> at the hotel when she was younger and almost getting frostbite because her mom dropped her off not knowing grandma wasn't there I don't know why the hotel wasn't operational but and, and freezing to death and that's kind of one of the visions that Fran sees uh, and then also the scene where we do see Molly Ringwald personified there's this issue with regarding a hug that is also of course tied into Ruthie's past. What did I like? I like how the movie looks. I think the location's really cool. Um the overall like the basic story of this woman who ends up killing her mom in a hotel and is having visions. That's interesting. Um that's about it. There's <laughs> also an element used where there's this liquid which I think is milk that is uh, showing up several times and that the uh the climax of which the Ruthie takes a literal shower in milk that just kind of starts happening. And it, to me, it, it kind of meant that the hotel itself is a metaphor for the, what provided Ruthie sustenance as a child. Like the hotel is breastfeeding her. Like that's her mother. Like that was what provided her a semblance of care. I think the filmmakers are relying too heavily on visual cues and symbols. And it all feels like too much because to start... We see Ruthie wearing the CPAP machine like three times. Mm -hmm. Then we hear Fran say that she wore her CPAP machine. Like there's mention of the CPAP machine like five times. So then when we see the killer wearing it, like I, like I don't know that we needed such a heavy hint that it belongs. I don't understand why that was so heavily... To, uh, to throw us off that it might be Fran who's having also like, you know hallucinations that that's my next note I don't like that Fran who's not the killer is also ha like is having delusions because then another sim visual symbol is we see these synchronized joggers like three or four times much like the twins in The Shining that aren't explained and I think that was the part I hated the most like you know the twins you know come play with us Danny in The Shining are very integral to what has happened in this hotel and I don't understand why the synchronized joggers had anything to do with comely sweets I think the actor playing Ruthie, the actor playing Brian, and Molly Ringwald do the best they can with what they were given. Yeah, I think Gail Rankin is quite interesting on screen. I thought Molly Ringwald looked great, despite the fact that she's wearing a red dress and red tights. Her outfit's a bit much, I but I think it's symbolic. Again, like a lot of yeah. visual cues. But the other three ladies, uh, Maddie, Kill, and Fran, I... Hari Neff has this 
Is it a sleeping wear that is one of the ugliest garments I've seen in a yeah, long time? Yeah, she's wearing time. a muumuu that's like distracting. But whenever, so, whenever that was on screen, I I hated. It. That was giving me the only visceral reaction this film. Gave. I didn't like this Kel character and the way it was performed. Earlier on, we see that she's just kind of obnoxious with Ruthie, and then we find out that she's the one who sort of pressured her to take this trip. And then Ruthie keeps saying, "I told you I didn't want to be here because I, my, my dead mama's upstairs." But there's a moment when, like, it's clear that Ruthie and Fran are having weirdness. And then Kel comes along and wants to start telling Fran, like, personal childhood things about Ruthie. That took me out. Well, she because can... the performance is not great. And then, what, like, the dialogue is Yeah, it's like, why are you me? telling all her business right now? And then at a, in a separate scene says, I can tell something's going to happen with Fran because of the way that you're looking at her. These Molly Ringwald TED Talks were so strange to be, like... <laughs> and again, I wish it had leaned more into the strangeness... And that could have been the tone, is the, the the kind of strangeness of it and more metaphor, I, I think, than trying to uh, navigate these four people whose relationship doesn't seem to make sense in any combination. We get a lot of the text messages on the phone from the mom, from like Fran gets text messages from Ruthie telling her to find her. I just feel like we also relied heavily on the text messaging, particularly between Ruth and her mom, because then in the end we find out she had her phone. And she's texting, so I don't know why they couldn't make it more subtle. And she's texting over, over and again, I love you. Like, you know, presumably because her mother never told her that. I, I've already seen a film this year about interge intergenerational women uh, owning a hotel and kind of going crazy and hating each other. Uh, Joao Canijo's Bad Living, which I would recommend that film over this. But again, I like the I like a lot of the ideas behind it and the setting is effective. I thought the friend character was so annoying and then when they leave her at the train station, I was relieved. But... <laughs> I would have left her ass too. Fran, did you know Fran spelled backwards is narf? That's a, that's yes. a pinky in the brain reference. Um, I think at the bare minimum where this movie doesn't work is like the tension between the four ladies. It, I think it needed to at least be like bodies, bodies, bodies. Sure. Where there's like a lot of like passive aggressive. It does read like, I mean, it felt very like how when you get a bunch of gay men together and, yeah. and there's all that weirdness of whatever. That part made sense to me, but... Blurred boundaries. I mm -hmm. think it's just the dialogue mixed with the acting. It just left it feeling really weird. Which is too bad because Gail Rankin's Ruthie, I think, is a really interesting character uh, with a, a ganglion of issues. But she reminded me kind of of the Franz Rogowski character in Passages recently. Mm. as just I'm gonna like very selfish and self-centered and maybe for good reason in some regard because she's going having a psychotic episode maybe but uh, she reminded me of like everybody else is kind of crumbling because of her decisions then speaking on Fran I didn't like again it almost feels like a red herring that Fran is the one who's gonna pop off because then Ruthie finds on her phone that Fran was convicted of killing like her partner. Like Fran's a real estate agent who killed her partner, but then immediately we see that Fran's phone is dead. So then it's like, oh, she probably imagined it. There's too much. There are too many blurred lines and overlaps, and that it, it was just annoying to me. Uh, and again, I don't mind those kind of ambiguities. In fact, I usually embrace them. It's just that this. It just didn't coalesce in any kind of interesting way. I, I just wasn't interested. The only it. smart part of this movie is when Brian sees, he walks into the hotel and he sees this, you know, figure with a covered face and a chainsaw and he immediately turns around and walks out. Mm -hmm. I thought he's the only one with any sense in this movie. Um, but then when, so then Matt, so after the Brian gets hit with the chainsaw, then Matt, Maddie, she gets cut in the arm pretty badly with like a large like kitchen utensil. The same one she was using to get that. And her off. reaction to it, I don't know if she was high out of her mind, but she is acting like she got a paper cut. She's like, I gotta get out of here. But very calm. Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, I don't know if it's the actor because she also has a scene at the end when she's running out of the hotel to try to save with, Kale with, with the, the chainsaw, chainsaw that she can't start. And she's kind of saying like, get away from her in a way that's not convincing at all. Yeah, I think that, that was the problem. It's, it's just not convincing. Oh my gosh, there's a moment when Ruthie towards the end is crying and she's doing that voice when you cry. <laughs> I started laughing. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. And there's also, so... Uh, we know what it is. The Fran starts playing a song 
that it's called Lonely Wait because I looked it up in the end credits and Ruthie has a reaction to it seemingly because it has some ties to her mother. It's like we know that but it's just like you couldn't find another song in the public domain that you could use that Mm, had, I don't know. This, that that the song was not effective at all. For there me. were some soundtrack selections that are like some of the score that did kind of create a mood. And again, I do like how it looks. I think the best part of the film is the cinematography, probably. Sure. Sure. And whoever scouted that location. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sorry to these people. I didn't care for this one. What would you give it? One and a half. Oh, and Grant Greenberg is the director of photography, by the way, since you shouted that out. I would give this film one and a half out of five. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.